Today's episode is so exciting, such a treat. One of my favorite people in the world. His name is Nikolai Engelbright. He's a spiritual advisor based out of Iceland. He's all over the world teaching breath work, body work, spiritual advisement. Um, he is the author of a book called Gangsters and Gurus, which will give you a little bit of a hint of his life story. Um, and I wanted to tell you guys before we dive into this, Nikolai is actually coming to the United States and doing an event with me in Park City. It's going to be March 17th through 19th of this year. There, it's We're keeping it pretty small, so there are limited spots. So check it out on my website, taragarrison.com forward slash transform if you want more details on that. Um, Nikolai is going to be coming and doing breath work. Um, getting deeper into the spiritual side of things. I'm going to be taking you guys through some cold immersion, some mindset things. Um, and we'll also be doing some nature immersion. It's going to be a very powerful event. Um, we have optional IV drips there. If you guys would like to add that to it. Um, so again, that's going to be March 17th through 19th of 2023, just outside of park city, Utah. And the link again is taragarrison.com slash transform. So check that out. Now we're going to get into the episode. Oh my gosh. I, I asked Nikolai if he would talk about the ego, if he would talk about healthy masculine. I highly recommend following him on Instagram as well. If you don't do that, it's just Nikolai. I think there's a underscore. Sorry, we'll link it up. I'm going off the top of my head. I think it's just Nikolai Engelbert with an underscore, but I'll, we'll link it in the show notes. His website is breathethroughlife.com. Um, yeah, he's amazing. He's drinking from that good cup. And so I'm excited for you guys to hear from him. And I hope to see some of you guys at our event in March in Park City. Okay, here is Nikolai. All right. So Nikolai, thank you for joining us all the way from Bali. Um, we have a mutual client and she kept telling me about you. And she's like, I, I was just hearing all, I was like, okay, this dude sounds pretty tapped in. This is good. This is good stuff. I'm glad you're working with him. And then she finally connected us on social media. And I mean, I, I told you, I went on a full bender of all your videos. I was like, this guy's drinking from the good cup. <laughs> and so, um, I want to give the audience a little bit of background on you. Can you tell them like now you're going all around the world doing spiritual advisory, working with people, helping them heal, helping them become more centered, grounded, you know, whatever's needed, but like, is, were you raised this way? Like, how did this all happen? <laughs> I was actually raised in this kind of environment. So I started mm -hmm. uh, a spiritual practice already when I was around eight years old. Mm. Uh, it was the first, you could say, like introduction into Tibetan Buddhism and mantra wow. studies. Wow. And that came as like a byproduct of my best friend uh, losing his life at that time. Mm. Uh, so of course, I was like, in this like kid environment and I was super happy and uh, how kids are of course at eight years old when uh, we are just living a normal life and then yeah. all of a sudden I was like snapped out into like whoa okay death life what happens after you die there was all of right. these massive questions um so from that uh, I started some of the spiritual practices at that age and um it was great it was amazing of course because I could uh, fall asleep again which was like my biggest concern at that time I could not sleep at night mm. Um, and then I think around 13, I had probably had like three very close people to me dying, uh, like three close deaths. Wow. And, and it was really difficult of, for obvious reasons to like sit still in school, to be present in school. It was like, yeah, really uncomfortable, basically. At that yeah. time, ADHD did not exist, so they didn't give me that diagnosis. But I'm pretty sure if it had been in the, <laughs> in the current state, that was really yeah. Let's not look at trauma, but like <laughs> that makes my heart hurt. Like eight and thirteen, because I have kids that age, and it's like that's so young to experience all of those big emotions. Yeah, massive. So what happened for me was just like I stopped, obviously, like following in school, and it kind of like just sidetracked me into to quite a few years of like a life in crime um obviously from like small things like how it always is i call it like the first cigarette choice so it's like you know you shouldn't smoke a cigarette but you still choose to smoke a cigarette and then from that you like yeah progress on it was like uh, importing cocaine and, and stuff like that into uh, to denmark so 21 around 21 i lost the right eye so i have an eye prosthetic here which was uh, like obviously related to that lifestyle i had um alkaline thrown in my face so an alkaline substance that was thrown on my face wow. um it's in the hospital for three months oh and my there gosh. was like 
I think that was like the first time that I like stopped. I had the army, of course. I was first in the army where I had like a break, but still somehow still connected to like violence and aggression. And <laughs> so it wasn't really a break, but it was like a little bit of a break from the streets. And then that was like the real like, okay, it was like stop. Like a very firm, I think, uh, sign from uh, <laughs> from the universe to like, okay, slow down, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I heard you on another interview talking about that. And like, it's interesting how many people I know that have been like, they're kind of in the depths of darkness. And then all of a sudden one day, just kind of out of nowhere, it's just like this like wake up moment of like, I can't do this anymore. And that that's kind of how, how you experienced it. It was just like this like... <laughs> random moments of something's got to change do you think it I was think, a result of being super low for so long or you know what led to that moment that's a big question i think it's like all of us receive information in the intuition like on the intuitive level yeah and i'm sure like almost everyone would have received at some point when they sit in their office job like oh i should do something different i should like go travel the world, I should go and explore something, but then they yeah. choose to not do it. Right. And of course, if we look at like free will and destiny is two very big concepts we could, <laughs> we could spend a lot of time talking about. But of mm -hmm. course, if our destiny is to, to live a lifestyle that is like um, in more alignment with the higher self and we keep on neglecting those uh, things, then something like this happen or a burnout happens or uh, yeah. like depression happens. Like there is something that is like forcing you to look yeah. at your shit. Yeah. And I got to say, I mean, losing your eye and being in the hospital for three months would really suck. But on the flip side, it really is mesmerizing on social media when you're teaching spiritual stuff. <laughs> it, works, <laughs> it works for you now. <laughs> um, okay. Like that was what was needed also to go out of it, right? So like sometimes yeah. those things are for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say it was the the, the my lowest low was the best the best worst thing that ever happened to me, right? <laughs> That's how I feel about it. It was just like that sucked. And it was also like so good for me and so needed to get me back into alignment. And so like, what did that path look like? Like, what'd you start doing when you had this like kind of, okay, I'm going to actually start listening to my intuition here. Like, what'd you do? The first thing I did was I went straight back to smoking weed because I didn't have, I had zero skills or like advice of like to do, like I didn't know how to do anything else. So the first thing I did was just to go back and then, of course, I felt like super heavy and I was like, OK, this doesn't work out. And um, I was just so lucky that like a friend of mine's father, he came and he just said to me, listen, dude, we are going on this journey. I owed him a lot of money from uh, from drugs that I hadn't paid him. So I was semi nervous. We were driving around. It's like the whole story is in my book. But um, we drove around. He took me to the breathwork course. We did five days of like very intense breathwork. Wow. Very, very, it's like three, three and a half hours a day. Wow. And when we stood and, fin and had finished those five days, I was obviously like completely mind blown. I'm sure anyone who have tried just like uh, 10 minutes of breath work would understand like how is the yeah. impact of like such intense at such intensity. And I mean, it was the first time that I could cry. It was the first time that I could uh, like connect to any of these traumas that was like mm -hmm. inside of me. So I just knew it like at that moment, I knew, okay, this is something that I have to do for myself. And within, I think, three or four months of practicing daily and like really doing the work, like I was really going all in because it was obviously like a life or death kind of situation for me. Yeah. Uh, I was invited to give a speech at a school and I was sharing my story for the first time. I was obviously super nervous. And I shared one breathing technique, like a very simple one with the with the youth and the story and i was obviously like very close to their age i think they were 17 i was 20 21 at the time so mm -hmm. it was like a massive impact on the on the young people of seeing someone their own age sharing and and then i just knew like okay this is this is what's gonna happen like that's the path yeah. that i'm gonna take yeah we, we get into so much in like the personal development world and even the spiritual world but more the personal development world like this like okay i gotta figure out what my purpose is all right let me think about it real quick well um you know <laughs> and i think <laughs> uh, you perfectly described like it just finds you and it's not it's usually not the way you think it's just 
you're just going with it. You're just going with the energy, flowing with the energy, like, and, and just saying yes to what feels right in the moment. And like, here you are now you're in Bali and you live in Iceland and you're, I know you're coming over to the state soon and just coming all over, like just going with the flow, you know, and it's so beautiful to see, like, I mean, I'm sure you still have moments of like being caught in the human illusion, you know, but for the most part, it's, it feels like you've, you're trusting the universe and just moving with it. Can you speak on that? So like I always say to people, it's like, if you dare to believe in the miracles, then the miracles will happen. Like if you say like miracles are happening to me, magic is happening to me, then it will happen. Whatever you experience that as a magic, because it is really the most natural phenomenon. I mean, like if we study nature um, and we have a seed, you can plant one seed that can make a thousand plants, but you could also plant a thousand seeds where nothing happens. Yeah. So for, for me personally, it was just about, allowing that flow and trusting the flow and i had had i have had like very intense times also on my journey where i really thought like oh my god this is never gonna work out i'm never gonna be able to live from my craft i'm never gonna like people are never gonna understand it and then all of a sudden three years later i was like boom everyone knew about breath work everyone was like oh my god breath work is the most amazing thing yeah. and now, like, i've been telling this for like six years <laughs> beautiful so good yeah and 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 just you followed like that guy that came was a gift you know and you said yes and i have to speak on breath work for a second because you know although i don't teach it like you do just my experiences with it like especially when i went to an ayahuasca retreat center i we did a uh it's, it's basically holotropic breath work or similar practices but it had a little few added things like the workers use their intuition and would like touch your feet or touch your shoulder or touch your forehead and like use their intuition to say little mantras and it was really beautiful but for me the breath work i have always said i'm like in terms of emotional processing the breath work was way more powerful than ayahuasca for me. And that's saying a lot. I want some powerful freaking medicine, but it was like, like you said, like, I don't really, I'm not afraid to cry in public, but I don't like love, like snot bawling, like boohooing, like just losing it, crying in front of like 40 people. I don't know, but that's where I was at. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really <laughs> open stuff, you know? So let's, let's talk about breath work for a second. You know, for, for some people, they're like, what do you mean breath work? You're just like breathing. Like what do you, can you describe in a nutshell for people who are unfamiliar, what we're talking about? I think it's important for people, especially in this day and age to understand that it is like the most vital energy source we have. Like there is no other energy source that is more vital than the breath, of course. So when we look at it from that perspective, it is like, it is what is keeping us alive as human beings. Usually we speak about food, we speak about exercise, we speak about mindset, we speak about all of these other things, but then the most important source is not even mentioned. Like if you look at most like, whatever, like a pyramid of happiness or whatever. Yeah. There's nothing about the breath there, but the way I work with the breath personally is, is a combination, of course, depending on the client and depending on what they need. I do a lot of addiction programs with people who have like very heavy and severe addictions with Xanax and all of this kind of mm-hmm. popular, let's call them popular drugs these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we can see is like after just 30 days of practicing different breathing techniques, that client will stop. Like they will literally temper out of like heavy medication that they have been on for for years like for 10 years 15 wow. years of their life and they can temper out within like 30 to to 60 days of course with the help of of other people like a, a nutritionist and stuff like that it's like of course everything has to be together yeah so the breath is kind of like a gateway where we can go beyond the mind. So a lot of the time we just look at the mind of like, what did you feel when you were 15? Which is also good. It's also an important part of a process, but it's not the only part. So there is also the somatic experience of Mm -hmm. where trauma is stored in the body. How do you get access to that trauma? And that is what we can do directly through the breath, like bypassing the mind, going straight into the trauma. And then on an even, Mm -hmm. I would say like more advanced level, we can go into the same kind of experiences that we go into with DMT, that we go into with ayahuasca, like we can go into a mind altering state and deeper states of meditations, of course, but it does require more than like DMT is like five minutes, you're straight in, you're straight out. Most people Mm -hmm. have no idea what they actually experience. They're just like, oh my God, this is really intense. Right. uh, 
with the breath work, it might take you five days. It might take you five years. Yeah. But yeah. When you, go, when you know what you're going into. You're like, oh, okay. This is the space. I know a lot of people, when I tell them about my breath work experiences, they're like, I'm telling them how I'm breathing. I'm kind of exemplifying it. And they're like, I don't think I could do that for an hour. Can you speak on that? Cause I'm like, I know I didn't think I was going to be able to either. <laughs> Can you speak on that? Have you ever seen anybody like not be able to do it? No. Okay. <laughs> I've had some people where they were really, uh, where they had like really severe lung disease where it was too, like where it could be too intense. So they could only do like a slower and meet, like they wouldn't be like, yeah, they wouldn't be able to do that for a long time, but only because of like a, a fitness, uh, you could say like a physical kind of, um, uh, specific specimen. issue right yeah, exactly. yeah. But, uh, i think once you go into it you kind of lose also the concept of time and you lose the concept of like how long are you actually doing it for at least if it's guided in the right way you sh should just be kind of in a trance state which we always have been able to go into as human beings a lot of people have forgotten it in our comfy lifestyle with uber eat and with all these different <laughs> things yeah. that the, but we used to always go into these kind of um yeah things, right so i i have never really experienced um people who couldn't do it i have seen people who weren't willing to go into the sadness so like the second the sadness or the anger came they would stop of course mm -hmm. i've met those people that it's just like no not ready which is fine and it's fair enough to do that also if you ever are in a breathwork session and you feel like okay Okay, this is too much because of course you shouldn't necessarily force yourself if you don't feel safe yeah yeah but, um, but now i mean i have taken i have taken thousands of people through through breathwork courses right and like from everything from ceos to uh, big dudes with tattoos in their face inside prisons to like anyone right mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful to see that once you go through the sessions, everyone usually comes out with the same feeling afterwards, which is like a deeper sense of peace, yeah. deeper sense of calmness, a um, nervous system that feels more balanced. Yeah. And once people have experienced that, that is, at least for most people, that is more addictive than any kind of substance that you could take for it. Yeah, I'll like take... I'll Any, take a yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll take nervous system regulation and coherence and being comfortable with feeling my emotions and tapped into the universe over Xanax any day. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um okay, I like since I have you, I want I just I want to I'm like I just want just want to let you roll, just let you teach. But one of the things I was talking to you about was I was like I'm assuming you're not on TikTok. Are you on TikTok? I actually yeah. had a TikTok for 5 days. Okay. <laughs> Like, like five or six days and then I was like nah this can't be happening and then I closed it <laughs> <laughs> okay I'm not surprised but on TikTok there's like so much and, and Instagram too and all the social media platforms from TikTok's real big on this there's so much and maybe it's just because I watch it and I so the algorithms keep sending it to me but there's all this stuff about masculine energy like it's specific there's masculine and feminine energy and we can talk about both but what I'm seeing is so, like a lot of I mean, I don't mean this in an egoic way, but it feels like a lot of confusion in regards to what healthy masculine looks like, because there was this like completely unhealthy masculine program that's been running for a really long time. Like, don't feel your emotions. Don't be a P word. <laughs> like, don't, you know, don't be weak, like be strong. Like even the, you know, conquering women and, you know, running all over everybody for success and like that program has been running a long time. And then there's kind of like this super pendulum swing. It just feels like there's like a lot of confusion around what healthy masculine looks like. And I think you're such a great example of that. Truly. I've told you that multiple times. And so I was wondering if you could just speak on healthy masculine, what that means to you. Thank you for that compliment. First of all, <laughs> I think when we look at both masculine and feminine, there is like, there is three principles that everyone has to kind of follow. It's like, it's the natural principles, the principles of nature. How has nature created us as a man, as a woman? Then there is the cultural principles. Which culture are we from? Where do we come from? What is mm -hmm. our cultural background and lineage, ancestral lineage? And then we have the spiritual um, principles, right? So when we combine those three principles as a man from the north, 
which is of course what what I can speak of. I cannot speak of it from from any other place of uh, cultural traditions and and heritage. We come from a place now where the women are very strong. They, they are very, very strong, both financially strong. They are like capable of a lot of things, which is super beautiful and amazing and awesome. And that has kind of created, I think, this pendulum swing that you talk about, where the man then went into being like super soft and just being like, oh, okay, I don't have to do anything. I can just, um, which is good. Sit and feel my emotions, wow. but it can also be like an over, uh, what can we say? Like it can be like an overreaction to that. Yeah. The yeah. women are all of a sudden going into a very strong masculine energy. Mm. So I think what we are being invited to, at least in um, in the Nordic countries specifically, is that the men has to take back this role of being a safe space because that is what's missing because mm. that is the masculine energy. If you look in nature, the masculine energy is like a very direct, it's a penetrating. Literally like a penetrating. Hello, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she would come over and want to hear you. <laughs> my cat, if you're on audio, my cat just made an appearance, a slight appearance before I pushed her away. Okay. <laughs> the masculine energy is a penetrating energy from nature's side, right? So like it is about penetration. It is about like, mm, we could call it like manifestation. Like that is the, the energy that we carry. And I carry it, you carry it. Like everyone carries the masculine energy, of mm-hmm. course. But it's also the energy that is supposed to create the space. So we are we are able to create the perimeters where the woman, the female energy, is supposed to create the home. If we could take like a house as an example, right? So the man would create the perimeters, like this is our house, this is how it functions, and the female energy would be able to create everything inside. So as a man, what it means is means, of course, that you have to be able to, to hold your woman in those emotions as an example. Like you have to be solid enough in yourself and know yourself on a deep enough level and your own emotions, of course, at a deep enough level that you can connect to your female on that level or connect yeah. to your partner. On that level. So what we are seeing is like the toxic masculinity, if you can call it that, or the old school masculinity, which still has its rights because it came from a time where uh, the, like, even if you go two generations back in Iceland, uh, people were still living in like small huts and people were dying at sea, like daily people would be dying at sea. In Denmark, it was the same, my grandfather's generation from Second World War. So of course they had much more silent hard men who just had to survive and they just had to do right. probably whatever was needed to just have food on the table. I mean, my right. father grew up without almost anything, which is, I would say for most people, both in America and in Europe, that's a that's a strange concept to have. At least the people that we work with and ourselves, it's like probably like quite strange concept to not have any food for two days, as an example. Yeah. Um, where just one generation back, that was quite normal that, okay, you're just eating leftovers, you're just here, we're going to mm-hmm. be fasting after Christmas, we're not having any food for these days because we had a lot of food there. And now it's like volunteer fasting, of course. So to understand like the culture at that time created those men that were like the silent de-associated because they had to survive. They did not have the means maybe to to be connected to the emotions because it wouldn't function. Where now we have, of course, a society that is supporting the man in being able to feel his emotions, but still being able to take presence because I, at least a lot of the women uh, I speak to, uh, sisters that I speak with, they are also missing this men who are a man, who are taking you on a dinner date, who are holding the door, who are able to do these things for you, who are not just like sitting in a, sorry for the cacao people, who are not just sitting in a cacao circle somewhere singing and crying um, every day. It's good to do it some days, of course, and it's yeah. great that, that there is space for that, but it can't be the only thing. Um, so I think there has been uh, with the, with the, um, what can we call it, like the modern principles of feminism, where my mom was one of the main feminists in Denmark, and she was really uh, proud to to support that movement and fighting for it and everything. (laughs) But I think what happened with with the modern day approach was that a lot of the women took a very masculine approach. Yeah. So instead of seeing like the, the infinite potential that the female have, and if we could create a society, I mean, there was more 
based in the feminine, it would be much more nice for all of us to be in. But instead of doing that, they took the role of the masculine of like, okay, I'm going to be like the head of this company and I'm going to work just like the men and just as hard on everything instead of going the opposite way and saying like, hey, I want to get paid just as much as the CEO, but I want to have one week off every month as an example. Right. That would be really honoring the feminine. Like in my in my world, that would be like, wow, that was how, and that is how it should be. Like there should be space for that because yeah. essentially we are the creators of the reality ourselves, right? The human yeah. being. So, so why did we not choose to honor that? Yeah, I think so, for a lot of women, especially in business, and I can relate, it's like the only model for a long time was in business was from men. Right. And, and kind of from that space, not all men, but a lot of men were in that kind of more toxic, unhealthy masculine energy. And so it was almost like, you know, following patterns of success, I think, right. It's just like, Oh, this is how you're successful. And yeah, it's because we've been so removed and there were many cultures that had matriarchal societies, but like, to me, like what I've learned in my own entrepreneurial journey is my intuition guides, everything, everything. And it's like that moment of like, this doesn't feel right, honoring that and shifting. And of course, men can do that too. But I think that's how I've learned to honor my feminine is like, I, I know that's how other people are doing it, but like, I'm not, that doesn't feel right to me at all. So I'm going to stay here with, with this. Like, cause I, I mean, I think our greatest strength is our intuition, men and women, but women are like, I mean, <laughs> pretty, pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty intuitive, you know? And I think if we honor that and what feels right to us, we can lead. And you're exactly right. Probably what feels right to women is having a freaking break sometimes because we got a cycle every month, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you get a little more tired and you want to go within and you want to be intuitive. And so, yeah, I love that example. Um, by the way, uh, Nikolai's book is called gurus and gangsters, right? Your gangsters book. And gurus. Oh, gangsters. gangsters and gurus. Okay. That sounds better. Good job. <laughs> okay. So we'll link that up and then, um, I'll link up your social media. Is, it, is that the best way for people to find you is through yes. Instagram? Okay. Sure. okay. Right now I just work with clients that, uh, referred actually. Yeah. It's always a good sign. <laughs> um, yeah, you're kind of you're kind of the underground. So thank you for coming <laughs> into the light on my podcast. Um, okay. Uh, also, another question. I love one of your first videos that really connected with me was when you were talking about the ego. Someone had asked you if you would do a video talking about the ego. Um, and I was watching that with someone recently, and they were like, "What? What does he mean by the ego? Like, what's that? Right?" So I I realized I was like, "Okay, some people haven't read like Eckhart Tolle, like they're not even familiar with this concept of the ego," which made me really sit back. Honestly, I was like, "Oh my gosh, I talk about that all the time," and like probably a lot of people don't even know what I'm saying. They think I'm talking about like being egotistical, right? Like a big macho. So can you talk about like what we what we're talking about when we talk about the ego, and then your thoughts. I love your approach because you're talking about like, not there gets to be this, like, I'm going to reject the ego. I'm going to hate the ego. Like, I don't want any ego. And it's like, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so can you, can you first explain what it is and then talk about like a healthy relationship with the ego? Like, I want to say personally on my own journey, that was my first approach was like, I'm going to be ego less. I'm going to have zero ego. I'm just yes. going to eradicate it. I'm going to kill it. It's going to be over. Um, until I sat with a teacher who was like, listen, if you don't have an ego, that means you're going to be dead. Right. Like, if, you're done, if you're done, like then your journey is finished. And I was like, oh, okay, wait, <laughs> maybe I don't want to, <laughs> just yet at least, maybe I want to wait a little bit before I go into that. <laughs> yeah. So for me, uh, everything I teach is always rooted in either Vedic science, which is from India, or mm -hmm. it's rooted in Chinese philosophy of Taoism, right? So that is where, that is the main studies I've done. So I always have a um, relationship back to that. And from India, we have a model that is called the five sheets, which we then divided up into seven levels of existence. So it's the seven levels of where every human being can exist on. Mm -hmm. And we have, of course, the physical, the body, obviously the most gross level, the most tangible level. Um, the second level being the breath. So that means you can see the body, but if there's no breath, of course, the body is dead, obviously. So the breath is what's keeping the body alive. Then we say even deeper than that, like more subtle, we have the level of the mind. So the mind we could talk about for a whole hour just by itself, but as a quick uh, just reflection for people, it's connected to the senses. So anything we sense is received in the mind, like, okay, I'm sensing this, I'm sensing that, but the mind can also 
be in a conversation with someone and go somewhere else. So that means like we become mindless, we could say, right? Like the mind starts jumping into the future, starts jumping into the past, which is also where stress is created. So the more of that oscillation in the mind there is past, future, past, future, past, future, the more stressful the present is. Mm -hmm. um, next layer we can say down deeper than that is the intellect. So the intellect is the processing of the body, of the mind, sorry is where we process the information so we receive it through the mind mm -hmm. it's the intellect we say this is right this is wrong useful not useful belief disbelief blah 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 right all of them are great all of them are essential levels of where we exist then we have beyond that memory of course the storage we store all the things both physical memory like memory that is connected to the body and memory that's connected to the mind traumas uh, good experiences like we can we can cultivate a memory of miracles as an example mm. so the more miracles we remember that has happened to us the more of that we will also attract of course law of attraction mm. then the last level that are there um before the soul is the ego which is the question of course but it's just to give like a um yeah bigger uh, understanding mm. for people so the ego is what it is our personality but it's also what creates separation so we have a we have on a cellular level oneness with everything like if you study down to the smallest cell the smallest particle of the of the world everything becomes one basically so for us to know that like okay i'm not the cup i'm nikolai even though a cell technically a cell could go from me into the cup and the cup could go into the tree like mm -hmm. this is like this is science based this is not uh, right. <laughs> like spirituality or vedic based so to know who i am i need my ego the obstacle that we then face is there is the big ego right like the one you talked about like the dude who is in the gym which is actually usually the small ego which is fun because they look like it's the big ego like yeah, yeah i'm much better than everyone else but if you go a little bit deeper it's actually the opposite it's like feeling inferior and therefore yeah. taking that like very strong uh, masculine dominated position right and we have that ego so we have these two egos and imbalances the one that thinks they are better than everyone and the one that feels unworthy yeah so of course for us you and me one of our main tasks is of course to connect people into a healthy connection to that ego to say it's fine to feel great mm -hmm amazing like you should feel good if you achieve something you should celebrate it but you can celebrate it without feeling better than anyone yeah like i can say like i'm amazing at breath work without saying i'm better than this person at breath yeah work. or i'm worse than that person at finance right. like i can right. just say i need to improve my finances or i need to improve my relationships right. or whatever it is right um so understanding that and one of the clear signs to understand uh, just to finish the ego to understand which you could also speak an hour on <laughs> to understand the ego is that when the ego manifests it always manifests as mm, tightness yeah it's like you feel like tight in the body yes uh, so i always give people like a fun example like okay imagine you walk in to a room everyone in the room is astrophysicists and you know that everyone is like on that level of uh, interaction and you walk in and you're the only one who is not there. How do you feel? <laughs> some, some of us would feel fine. Like for myself. I would feel very curious. I would start asking tons of questions, <laughs> but the, yeah. Like, that's the one who is in balance with the ego, right? Where it's like, okay, I want to know. Like I just see that person for a person, but then you have a lot of people who would feel like, oh, I don't know what to talk to these people about because they are all talking in terms that I have no idea about. Um, right. that is of course the ego that we walk in and we're like oh, right. oh no everyone here is a ceo or like everyone here is uh even the other opposite way also right like oh everyone here works in uh works in a convenience store it's like oh, what am i gonna talk to them about what do they have to offer me right. it could also be in that way like the, the reverse way down right, right? it's like a sh to me what it feels like that tightness you're talking about it feels like a shield has come up on every single cell or, or in your entire energy body, just put up a shield of protection somehow to protect you from this perceived pain in a way. 
Yeah. Exactly. Mm. And that's where we could say, like, of course, um, the further we go into the spiritual path, the less, the less I'm saying less because it's not really tangible like that, but the less ego there is, like the more we feel connected to everyone. Mm-hmm. So it's not that we don't have our personality because we still have our personal traits. We still have our toxic traits, our divine traits, mm-hmm. everything. But we feel more and more connected to the people around us. Mm-hmm. And in the, in the um, popular spiritual culture, we could call it popular, the mainstream spiritual culture, you will see that is one of the most egocentric cultures that are existing right now where there is the most judgment of like if you're not eating uh, vegan food you're not spiritual with us if you're not right. singing this song you're not spiritual with us if you're not doing this you're not spirit like you're not spiritual mm-hmm. enough right mm-hmm. it happens right. in the food world too like oh i eat all organic high quality food i'm like better i'm a better right. person you know the ego even though those are wonderful things to do to eat organic oh, regenerative yeah. you know but the ego so quickly turns it into, and now I'm better, right? Or now I'm worse because I eat only fast food. I'm a I'm a horrible piece of scum person, right? Like it goes both ways with food or spirituality or success or our looks or all of these constructs of the ego. <laughs> and when you meet, of course, the, the 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 real generation of spiritual teachers, which is usually not really on Instagram and not really doing like the people that I studied with, like you would never see them on any any like you wouldn't really see them anywhere they are just they are yeah. embodying that and they have chosen that lifestyle yeah and they connect to everyone and there is no judgment of your actions they might say to you uh, you have too big you need to eat less yeah but they would never say it with like a, a, a an like a condescending or like an aggressive Judgmental. way it's just like a, yeah it's just like a, hey if you want to be able to do kung fu you need to lose weight. Like that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's just honest. And that's another thing I found the more connected we are with ourselves, the more love and light and goodness we give ourselves, the ego calms down and we're able to be truly honest with those around us. And there's other, some cultures I've noticed, you know, like I have, I have a degree in Spanish. I was gonna be a Spanish teacher. I don't know if you know that. And I, the reason I was so drawn to the Spanish language and Spanish speaking cultures is I find that they're very they're much more that way. Like if someone could say, Hey, you're, you look awful. Like you, you like, you look really unhealthy. What's going on. And, and they'll respond with, I know I'm eating really bad and I'm not sleeping well. And it's just like a genuine, there's no offense. There's no judgment. It's just honest communication, you know? And, and I, and I, I, I love that. I love that. Like that on both sides, they're comfortable being honest with each other. And that's what I find like the ego when the ego is turned down a little bit, I'm not saying that Spanish speaking cultures don't have some of that. They, of course we all do, but like I, I, it's beautiful when you see that it's beautiful when it's given and received in, in genuine connection without judgment. And that's what happens. I think when the more we um, befriend make friends with our ego. We see our own, I see my own stuff all the time. You know, if my clients read my personal development work, they'd be like, damn, this girl's got some freaking problems, <laughs> but I'm so <laughs> honest with me. It's the kindness that comes in. It's like, oh, that's okay. I see. Uh, oh, wow. You've been judging yourself for that. Okay. That's all right. Like, let's look at it. You know? Okay. Sorry. I digress. <laughs> that's also how we become the best captain, right? Of like, of a ship is like, of course, if, if like, I always say that to people for me, the most important when I study myself with anyone is that I know that that person has practical experience. That yeah. is not just a theory that they learned in a two days course. And then it's like, oh yeah, that sounded great. I'm just going to say that out loud. But I know <laughs> it's a real person who actually went through that like metamorphosis because it is, it is, I'm not going to swear because we're. You can swear. Stuff. This is a safe space to it speak freely. Fucking, it is fucking intense to go through some of these processes, yes. right? To really own your shit and to look at it and to like, see like, oh shit. Like even after 10 years, we can see something and we're like, wow, really? I'm still carrying that yeah. stuff with me. That's Always. Like, that's, still, that's still fucking present with me. And um, and of course, that is, for me at least, the most important. Anyone I work with, anyone I study from and study with and learn together with, it's like, I have to know that it's practical and not theoretical. Yeah, yeah. It's just and- so much theory and it's like, 
I can't use the, the theory for anything. It makes everything so confused. Yeah. You hit on something so important. I want to highlight and it's because sometimes I see, and maybe you run into this too with your, my clients will be like, Oh, I can't believe I'm still doing that. Like it's this kind of self bludgeoning, you know, I thought I was past that. And I was, <laughs> and it just makes me giggle. Cause I've been there too. Right. It's like, Oh, I'm healed from people pleasing. And it, then you learn like five years later, like, Oh, okay. I'm just always going to see ways that I'm seek, sneakily doing this. And I didn't realize. And just, it's just when you realize it's just like meditation to me, like people get frustrated. My clients, I don't know about you, but they'll go, they're like, I can't stop thinking. <laughs> and I just laugh because I'm like, you're not gonna, you're not, it's just, it's being gentle with it. A thought comes in and I'm like, Oh, I should text Catherine about blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and gently like, let it go, let it go. You know? And like, when we have these awarenesses of like, Oh, wow. I was really self-protecting there. And I had no, I didn't realize I was doing that. It's just accepting it. And I mean, like, okay, working through it, working with it, you know, giving love to it. Like when the thoughts come into meditation, just like a loving, like, (laughs) apparently I'm really thinking about texting Catherine about that thing. Okay. You know, and just like lovingly let it go. Like, I find it's the same way when our ego ramps up and it's like, Oh, you really wanted to be seen like that. in that scenario, that's, I, that's okay. That's okay. It's like, all right. So what, what did you need there? And then it's like, what's the pain? What's the fear? What's the insecurity? Okay. All right. That's okay. You know, we're working with that. And I think having that, um, not having expectations that we're going to like be done, (laughs) Right. Um, I would say if, well, if you're done healing then you might as well just transcend, I don't I, <laughs> or <laughs> done learning. You might as well not be here anymore. You know, <laughs> I think it's one of the beginners, uh, like wishes, right. It's like, okay. Cause we are so used. And it's again, like the masculine kind of way of studying. It's like, we are so used to like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But then when we really go into the, to these kind of studies, we see like, oh, wait, Sometimes we can learn from A and then we learn C and then we have to learn all the other steps. Yeah. It's like a new cycle all of a sudden. That's at least how I experience it. I 100%. feel like every time I come to that where I'm like, okay, I really get it. Then it's like everything changes again. And I'm yes. Like, oh. Right. It's like, oh, I thought I, I, <laughs> I thought I had that all figured out. Okay. Another level. Here's another level. Okay. Last, last section here, I guess. Like, I'm putting you on the spot, but is there something like a a pattern that you've noticed that's like really going on in the human collective right now that you would like to address? Like, I know I have these things like this all the time that are like, wow, that one, that one's big. That one's going through the collective, like massively anything like that stand out to you that you'd like a mic on separation, which is of course connected to the ego, like this thing of like, and it makes me really sad because we have been here for so long, like we have been on the earth for so long. And to see that people are still discussing and fighting over gender, race, culture, it's like, how is that possible? Like, how is it possible that people are still feeling so separate? Like, even like I said, in the spiritual community, which is, which is like, like in, in in Uber, it's clear that like we are the spiritual people and then there's like white people upper middle class and they come and they don't care about any of the local people they're like completely separated societies that are just like throwing plastic bottles everywhere and you're like dude like what are you like what what is going on right like what is really going on like where where is the unity concepts And I feel like it's the biggest thing that we have to, on a collective level, like begin to practice more of is like, how can we all feel unified regarding Mm -hmm. someone identifying as a male or someone identifying as something else? It's like, okay, everything should be able to coexist. Just like we see, like I talked about the three principles, like we see in the natural principles, Mm -hmm. there is no problem there. If Mm -hmm. some, like there is a tree, there is a rock, there is a river, there is a plant, there's an animal, it's like everything is there and none of them, well, sometimes the animals are fighting, but usually none of them are fighting with each other. So everything is just coexistence and like how we can change into that. And for me, I do believe that the more we work with ourselves, uh, the more we work with our mindset, the more we work on a spiritual level, the more we come into that understanding and uh, the English word forbearance, 
both towards ourselves, forgiveness and forbearance, but also towards the people of like, okay, everyone can coexist together. And it doesn't matter if someone eats a steak and someone else wants to eat tofu. Like it really doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, it does not matter. What matters is of course our approach towards that person. And can we show love? Can we show kindness to the person? And then if we want someone to change, I mean, that would also be the way that they can change if we really believe that like, okay, they shouldn't eat the tofu, which uh, I'm a strong believer of personally that they shouldn't eat too much tofu at least. <laughs> but that would never come from me trying to blame or like guilt trip someone into it. Like that would only come from a loving conversation of like, hey, like I also like the taste of that or I can understand it and then together transform. So it is really like my big prayer and also with the with the space that we are building here in Bali is like that there is more and more spaces where everyone can come together no matter what they have experienced. I feel so often like when we have to do these like who is your target market as an example? Like who are you addressing? Like Nicola, you have to give us now like are you addressing like people from 20 to 35? Like I had a coach who was doing that and I was like, dude, like I can't give you that. Like I sometimes I work with like a dude in the prison who is like 60 and other times I work with a, like some kid from a like super wealthy family who is 19. It's like, I, I, I don't have a target market. I just work with like a human being, like the human beings is my, my market that I, like, that I work with. And like to expand that field of like, of course there's some people that will relate more to me and some people that will relate less, but like, how much can we relate to everyone and how much space can we create for everyone to be there? Even if we disagree with them, mm -hmm. even if we are not um, agreeing to what they say, or we don't believe in it, like how can we create that space? So it doesn't become like a religious, because I feel like a lot of movements, they have like a very religious approach where it's like, there is no spirit inside it. It's just it's like, this is the right way. This is what you do. If you don't do it, then you suck kind of like, then you're yeah. going to help it. Right? Yeah. It's like the essence of it. So like trying to move away from that into like a more, mm, like a higher level of consciousness and also like a more um, refined version of that, of like saying like, okay, we are like billions of people and there's billions of different ways to live and there's billions of different ways to reach uh, God or love or consciousness. So why is it that all of them cannot just like coexist together? Like why, why wouldn't they be able to coexist? Uh, so that is like really like a big prayer that I have is like that we can come closer to that, to have less of this separation. Mm, I love that. Thank you, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, for me, that's, you hit on nature. I, I fully admit I go into the energy all the time, the separation energy I, all the time. And it's, it's so helpful for me to sit in nature and just be, because to me, it appears that the trees and the plants and the flowers don't have the ego construct that we have. <laughs> I don't know if they do, but it doesn't seem like they do. They just are, they just are. And when I sit in stillness and nature and just breathe and just am, it is the ultimate sense of, of, of allowance, right? Just allow, just being, just allowing, like there's nothing to do. There's nothing to be, there's nothing to say, there's nothing to want. There's nothing to need. There's no desire. It's just accepting, you know, being part of the greater whole. So if any of you guys are like me and so get in your little tirades, like that, everybody who follows me on social media knows I get into sometimes that is like, has been the most helpful thing to like, get me out of those states, right? Breath work also meditation, also tapping into my heart, you know, um, and uplifting music. Those, all of those are things that help me get out of that, but you're right. Like it's, it's at an ultimate high. And I always have to check my own ego when I'm like, they're, they're creating separate, they're, <laughs> they're separating people. And like, what am I doing? Like, you know what I mean? Like I always, like, I'm doing my, it's like, I'm judging someone for being judgmental. Oh, there it goes again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's a constant, constant work in progress, but it's a really, really important thing. I think for all of us, if we want peace, if we want enlightened states, if we want to be more tapped in, you know, I felt from my guides multiple times that like, their energy is very, um, sensitive and loving and gentle. And that when I'm in harsh energies, it's, they don't resonate 
with that. So they just kind of like, it's not that they're gone. It's just like, it's not a resonant energy. So it's like, if you want to be closer and hear guidance and, you know, be in this energy, like go into the energy of unconditional love is what I've, I'm always being taught. Go back. So how can you practice unconditional love there? And it always goes into empathy of like, well, I'm a human too. And I have also, and who am I to say what's right for them? And all of that comes in. So yeah, it's a really important thing you're talking about. And thank you for coming on all the way from Bali early in the morning. It's so good to see you. So good to connect with you on zoom. And I can't wait. We've got a little future event coming up that I'll tell people about later (laughs) pretty soon, probably need to tell them, but (laughs) maybe it'll be announced by the time this comes out. Um, okay. So other than that, uh, they can read your book. They can find you. So do you want to tell your, well, we'll just, we'll just link his Instagram handle. How do you say your last name? Engelbrecht? Right. Angle. Angle bright. Right. Okay. It means what? Bright. Bright angel. Bright angel. Oh my gosh. So perfect. (laughs) All right, Nicola. We'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.